So uh, uh, welcome to uh, this constitutional conversation uh, sponsored by the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School and co-sponsored, which we don't usually do, uh, with the Zephyr Institute, uh, which calls itself, it doesn't call itself a think tank, it calls itself a think and do tank, so we'll see. Uh, but from my experience with them, what they seem to do, and do very well, is to uh, bring very interesting speakers, sponsor discussions, and try to bridge some of the gaps uh, uh, in, uh, you know, between people uh, here at Stanford and uh, around the community. So thank you to the Zephyr Institute and Bat Bowman for, uh, 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 for co-sponsoring. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Robbie George, Robert P. George, the uh, McCormick uh, Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton uh, University. He scarcely requires uh, an introduction. He's one of the best known uh, legal and public intellectuals in the United States. Uh, he teaches, as the, his title would suggest, uh, at Princeton University, where he uh, teaches constitutional law, civil liberties, uh, natural law, uh, and political philosophy. He uh, has degrees from a number of institutions, none of them this one, so I won't bother <laughs> to uh, mention what they are. Uh, uh, grew up, uh, one very interesting item from his, uh, uh, from his bio that I didn't know before, although I've known Robbie, what, 30 years, yeah. something like that, very long time, uh, is that he uh, grew up as the, in West Virginia, I think I did know that, yeah. uh, but as the son of uh, immigrant uh, coal miners in, uh, in West Virginia. So uh, uh, that's a long way from Palo Alto. <laughs> and uh, he's going to be speaking to us tonight on the topic constitutional structures, political culture, and civic virtue. So please join me in welcoming Professor George. Thank you, Michael. Good. Thank you. I'm uh, very, very happy to be here and grateful uh, to my dear old friend, uh, Professor uh, McConnell, from whose writings uh, I have uh, been drawing uh, illumination and inspiration for uh, more than 30 years. And I'm grateful to the Zephyr Institute for co-sponsoring uh, this afternoon's lecture. Those of us who are citizens, as we in the United States are, of liberal democratic polities, don't usually refer to those who govern us as our rulers, now do we? It's our boast that we rule ourselves. We're a self-governing people. And there's truth in this, in as much as we participate in choosing the people who do rule. And so we prefer to speak of ourselves uh, as citizens, not as subjects, and to speak of the people who govern us, not as our rulers, but rather as servants public servants, or at least people being in public service. So a typical American politician who's been at it for a while, serving in Congress or uh, serving uh, in government, uh, will say, I've spent my career in public service. Now, of course, these so-called servants are nothing remotely like the servants in Downton Abbey or upstairs, downstairs, or the Duchess of Duke Street. The extraordinary prestige and usually the trappings attaching to public office in just about all times and in all places would by themselves be sufficient to distinguish, say, Governor Jerry Brown or President Donald Trump from Carson the butler. But that prestige signals an underlying fact that discomfits our democratic and egalitarian sensibilities, namely the fact that even in liberal democratic polities, high public officials are, in fact, rulers. They make rules. They make the rules. They enforce the rules. They resolve disputes about the meaning and applicability of the rules. To a very large extent, at the end of the day, what they say goes. And that's what it means to rule. That's what it means to be a ruler. Now, of course, our rulers don't rule by dint of sheer power, the way the mafia might rule in a territory over which it happens to have gained control. 
but rather our rulers rule lawfully. They rule according to law. I mean not only that, ideally, they stay within the law in carrying out their functions, but they have office because they're in office according to the rules, the constitutional rules that provide for the election or appointment to office. Constitutional rules specify public offices and settle procedures for filling them. Whether the Constitution exists as the United States Constitution does or the Constitution of California does in the form of a specific document, or whether it exists in some more informal form, such as in the United Kingdom or in New Zealand, an unwritten constitution. Whether written or unwritten, the constitution, the constitutional rules, constitute, are constituted by, the set of rules and procedures governing the rulers, rules that both empower office holders to make and execute decisions of various sorts, and also characteristically limit the powers. They establish what the scope of the powers of the institutions and the people occupying the institutions actually are. So though they are rulers, they're not absolute rulers. Constitutional rules set the scope and thus the limits of their jurisdiction and authority. Authority. They are rulers who are themselves subject to rules. Rules they do not themselves make and cannot easily or purely on their own initiative revise or repeal. They rule in limited ways and ordinarily for limited terms, which may or may not be indefinitely renewable at the pleasure of the voters. They rule by virtue of democratic processes by which they came to hold office, these rulers in liberal democratic polities. They can be removed or significantly disempowered at the next election if the people are not happy with them. Still, for all that, for all those constraints and limitations, they rule. That's what they do. They make the rules. They apply the rules. They interpret the rules. They enforce the rules. They execute the rules. Now, my point is not to hoot at the idea of government and those holding governmental offices and controlling the government, uh, controlling the levers of governmental power as servants. I don't want to hoot at that idea. On the contrary, I want in the end to defend that idea, the idea that rulers truly can be servants. That that's not, I want to claim that's not a laughable notion. I want to establish, however, that if these people we call public servants are indeed servants, they are servants in a very special sense, a sense that is compatible with their being at the same time rulers. They are people who serve, serve us, by ruling. They serve us well by ruling well. If they rule badly, they serve us poorly. Indeed, they disserve us. Now, there are, of course, lots of ways that rulers can disserve those whom they have a moral obligation to serve by ruling well. Most obviously, there is incompetence. Then, of course, there is corruption. And at the extreme, there is tyranny. So what does it mean for the ruler to truly be a servant? In other words, what does it mean for someone holding political office and exercising public power to rule well. Well, it means making and executing decisions for the sake of the common good, not for the sake of personal or partisan or tribal or ideologically tribal interests. Such decisions will necessarily be compatible with the requirements of justice and at the same time embody justice. If we understand the concept of the common good, properly, and I'll say a word about that in a moment, then we will see that no decision that violates a requirement of justice is truly for the common good. And no decision that genuinely upholds and serves the common good will fail to advance the cause of justice. Aristotle famously distinguished rulers who serve from the com for the common good from tyrants by identifying as the tyrants the people who rule for narrow interests. 
uh, self-interest, tribal interest, the interest of the clan, the group, his guys, his team, as opposed to those who rule for the common good. Now, it's also important to note that decisions can fail to serve the common good and can indeed damage the common good, even when they are not unjust. My, my proposition that all unjust decisions are contrary to the common good, no matter whose interest they advance. But not all decisions that are just, in the sense of not unjust, are for the common good. Even honorably motivated and well-intentioned people, including rulers, can make decisions that harm the common good, not because they're ruling in a partisan manner, or a narrow manner, or a self-interested manner, but because their decisions are unwise, inexpedient, imprudent. Holders of public office, like anyone else, can make poor, even disastrous decisions, even when acting on the purest and best of motives. That's just a fact about the veil of tears in which we live. That's a fact about the human condition. Poor decisions by well-intentioned public officials can trigger or prolong a Great Depression, for example. Lead a nation into an unnecessary or even disastrous war. Or prevent a nation from going to war to protect its people and their vital interests when it should have done. Can undermine or weaken cultural institutions on which much in society hinges for the well-being of society as a whole. There are lots of well-intentioned decisions that can cause a lot of harm because they're inexpedient, they're unwise, they're imprudent, they are misguided. And as any serious person who's held public office will tell you, many times the decisions that officials have to make, well-intentioned officials have to make, even ones of profound importance for the common good, are 5149 decisions. It's not obvious what the right decision is. Any reasonable person of goodwill might have come out the other way because the call is a close call. Now, it's worth adding here that reasonable people of goodwill also can and obviously do disagree about what the common good requires and forbids and what is, in truth, just and unjust. We have no moral consensus. We never really did, although there has been wider and narrower agreement over fundamental issues of justice uh, over the course of our history and over the course of human history. But certainly we in the United States today are nowhere near a consensus on many very important questions of justice and injustice, questions on which reasonable people of goodwill uh, on both sides agree that the question is a question of fundamental justice, but they just disagree about the truth of the matter, what justice in fact requires. Honorable people exercising public power can commit injustices, even grave injustices, while seeking truly in good faith to do justice, and while believing in good faith that they are doing justice. That's another fact that we had better take seriously about what life is like in this veil of tears and what the human condition is like, the condition that we find ourselves in. As people who are not only imperfect with respect to willing what we know to be right or wrong, but knowing what is in fact right or wrong. So just as not all violations of the common good are injustices, not all injustices are the result of malice or ill will or like vices. Still, all injustices, even if committed by officials who are sincerely trying to do the right thing, all injustices harm the common good. And here's the reason. It's because justice itself is a common good. It's a good that is in every citizen's interest. Justice itself is a common good. We all have an interest in the good of justice. We all have an interest in living in a just society. And it's not only a common good, but justice is a central aspect of the common good, the overall common good of the political community.
It is to the benefit of each and every citizen to live in a just social order. And harm to that order is therefore a loss at some level for everyone and not merely for the immediate and obvious victims of a particular injustice. Indeed, it is a loss, a harm, even for the ostensible beneficiaries of injustices and, de and indeed even for their perpetrators. Though, of course, naturally, true evildoers don't see it that way. Corruption of character narrows their vision of the good, blinding them to the profound respects in which wrongdoing harms what is in truth their interest in living in a just society as well as everyone else's. Uh, Hegel and other uh, philosophers uh, noted uh, during the period of slavery that slavery, while the ostensible, obvious, clear victim is the slave, also victimizes the slave master, who has as much of an interest as the slave or as much of an, of an interest in every, as everyone else in living in a just society. He seems to be the beneficiary of the injustice. He gets the slave labor. But in fact, he is harmed just as everyone is harmed uh, by an injustice, an evil such as slavery. Now, the common good requires, though, that there be rulers. Anarchy is not for the common good. Anarchy would profoundly damage the common good. So the common good requires that there be rulers and that they actually rule. To grasp this is to begin to see the sense in which good rulers are also, in truth, servants. And that we needn't hoot at the idea of rulers being servants. Members of societies face a range, sometimes a vast range, of challenges and opportunities requiring both means to ends and person to persons coordination, including in the case of complex societies like our contemporary modern societies, coordination problems presented by the large number and the complexity of other coordination problems. Since such problems cannot, as a practical matter, be addressed and resolved by unanimity, we can't solve basic issues of regulation and taxation, environmental uh, questions, traffic regulation, the whole, all the stuff of modern society by having New England town meetings, political authority is required. Institutions will have to be created and maintained, and persons will need to be installed in the offices of these institutions to make the choices and decisions that must be made and to do the things that need to be done for the sake of protecting public health, safety, and morals, upholding the rights and dignity of individuals, families, and non-governmental entities of various descriptions, and advancing the overall common good. This would be true even in a society of perfect saints, where no one ever sought more than his or her fair share from the common stock or violated the rights of others or deliberately acted in any manner that was contrary to the common good. Uh, I generally agree with James Madison, but on uh, one point I disagree. Madison famously said that uh, in a society of angels, no government would be necessary. Uh, but actually, a government would be necessary, even in a society of perfect saints, to stipulate the rules for the solving of coordination problems that can't be handled by unanimity or by custom or anything like that even in a society of perfect saints, a society of angels, effective coordination for the sake of common goals and thus for the good of all, the common good, would be required. And seeking unanimity, assuming a large and fairly complex society like ours, would not be a practical option. So authority would be required, and that means persons exercising authority. And persons exercising authority is just rulers ruling. But the moral justification for the ruler's ruling is service to the common good, the good of all. And the common good is not, ought not to be understood as some abstraction or a platonic form hovering somewhere beyond the concrete well-being, the flourishing of flesh and blood persons constituting the community. No, the common good just is the well-being of those persons and of the families and other associations of uh, persons, Burke's little platoons of civil society, of which persons are members. The right of legitimate rulers to rule 
is rooted in the duty of rulers to rule in the interest of all, not just in, self, in their self-interest or in their tribal or their group or their clan or their family's interest. In other words, the basis of the right to rule is the duty to serve. And the realities that constitute the content of service are the various elements of the common good. By doing what is for the common good and by avoiding doing anything that harms or undermines the common good, rulers fulfill their obligation to the people over whom they exercise authority, thus serving their interests, the interests of the people, their welfare, their flourishing, or in a word, serving them. Now, I myself don't know how to improve on the definition of the common good that's proposed by the Oxford legal philosopher John Finnis in his 1980 book, Natural Law and Natural Rights. The common good, Finnis says, is to be understood as the following, and I'll quote from him here. A set of conditions which enables the member of a, members of a community to attain for themselves reasonable objectives or to realize for themselves the values for the sake of which they have reason to collaborate with each other positively and or negatively in a community, unquote. Now, by positively and or negatively, what Finnis means is by cooperating together, that's positive, or by taking steps to stay out of each other's way, where the way to get things done is to not go bashing into each other. Notice that Finnis defines the common good as a set of conditions, and a set of conditions that enables people to achieve values for themselves, that is, by their action by their deliberation, thought, judgment, and action to, under, to, to achieve these for themselves where they have uh, good reason to collaborate with each other, to cooperate with each other, again, positively or negatively. Now, every community, from the basic community of a family to a church or other community of religious faith to a mutual aid society or other civic association to a business firm, will have a common good. Any community has a common good, no matter what the purposes are of the community, the defining, constituting purposes of the community. Now, the common good of some communities is fundamentally an intrinsic good rather than a merely instrumental good. By an intrinsic good, I mean something that provides a reason for action that doesn't require any further or deeper reason or other motivating factor for its intelligibility as a reason for acting. Uh, an intrinsic good is something that it makes sense to desire, it's intelligible to desire just for its own sake. Uh, friendship. If you've got a purely instrumental friendship, if two guys or two people are just using each other, that's not really a friendship. As Aristotle taught us, you know, if, you, if you have pe two people who are both willing the good of the other for the sake of the other, you've got a friendship. So friendship's an easy example of, of, a, of an intrinsic good. It might have lots of instrumental benefits. Because I'm friends with Professor McConnell, I get invited out to fancy law schools like Stanford to give uh, lectures. Or if I'm, uh, because I'm friends with Judy Romeo, where's Judy who's, who's in with all the fancy, beautiful people in Hollywood, I get invited to the best parties and so forth. Uh, but even apart from those instrumental benefits, I have a reason to be someone's friend uh, just for the sake of the friendship itself. Now, what about an instrumental good? That's something whose intelligibility is, a providing, is providing a reason for acting, a reason for doing something, consists in the ends to which that thing is a means, or those things are means. So the classic example there is money. Now, money is very valuable stuff. We all want it, right? We're all better off with more of it rather than less of it, although not quite true. Sometimes uh, you're better off with a little less than, than uh, more, in which case you should donate it to the Zephyr Institute, I think, if you have more than you, than you want. There, there, there you go. There you go. But if money, if you couldn't do something with money, if there wasn't some end to which money is a means, it would just be a little green paper. Uh, apart from some value it might have as a collector's item, Confederate money isn't worth anything. Because money is not intrinsically valuable. It's only valuable as a means to something else, the stuff you can buy with money. 
uh, or at the limit, I suppose, the status and prestige that having money uh, gives you. But money's just a classic case of a purely instrumental value. Another classic case is insurance. Believe me, trust me, nobody buys insurance because of the intrinsic value of insurance. <laughs> if you didn't get something, if it weren't a means to an end, protecting you against a catastrophe, you're, you're sharing the, the risk of the catastrophe with a lot of other people who are buying the insurance. Uh, if you didn't have that, insurance wouldn't be worth anything. So communities have, um, uh, uh, communities are, are integrated around the ends, purposes, values uh, they serve, and the common good of some communities is fundamentally an intrinsic good rather than an instrumental good. That's true, for example, of the community we call the family. Now, although families serve many valuable and some indispensable instrumental purposes, the point of the family is not exhausted by these instrumental purposes. You know, getting the babies diapered, getting the older children uh, off to school, uh, getting the kids to, uh, uh, to, to Little League or what have you. Uh, nor do these instrumental purposes actually define what the family is. The most fundamental point of being a member of the family isn't some end extrinsic to family membership. Rather, it's simply being a member of the family, enjoying the intrinsic and not merely instrumental benefit of being part of that distinctive network of mutual obligation, care, love, and support. That's among the reasons we generally think that when a woman gives birth in the hospital or the birthing center, we should send her home with her baby, not with a baby that was born during the time she was there, which you could do, right? You could, you could do it that way. You contribute one, you get to take one home. But we try to send her. It, it's, it's our sense of the intrinsic value of being a member of the family. Now, the same thing is true. That is the idea that the, there, there's, there are some communities whose fundamental, whose uh, constitutive good is an, is an intrinsic and not merely an instrumental good. That's also true, as it is of the family, of the religious community, at least in uh, Christian and Jewish thought. I believe the same is true of Islamic thought, and I don't know about the other traditions, but it's certainly true in Christian and Jewish thought. Though communities of faith characteristically serve many valuable instrumental purposes, there's the church picnic, there's the synagogue reading group, uh, there's the charitable activities, the social services provided by the religious community, the soup kitchen and so forth. There are all sorts of instrumental things that churches and other religious communities do. The most fundamental purpose of the religious community uh, in the case of Judaism, the purpose of Israel, or the, in the case of Christianity, the purpose of the church, is to be Israel, or the church, to be the people of God. That's what you're there for. You're not just there for the instrumental benefits. It's to be a member of this distinctive community. Now, things are obviously different when it comes to, let's say, business firms. And this is not to denigrate business firms. Although there are ordinarily many opportunities for principals and employees of companies to realize intrinsic or basic human goods, including goods that are fundamentally social, such as the good of friendship, in their collaborations in pursuit of the firm's objectives, those objectives, getting a product produced, getting the product to market, getting the product sold or the service uh, paid for, uh, reaping the uh, profits and so forth, those objectives are the ends to which the firm and the cooperation of those working in and for it are means. So it's no denigration of business to point out the obvious fact that the constituting good of the business community is fundamentally not an intrinsic good, as is the case of the family or the religious community, but is an instrumental good. The firm exists to provide the goods or services and to reap the profits of providing them, which is great, which is fine. Now, what about the common good of the political community? That's the $64,000 question. Is it like the common good of the family or the religious community, or is it like the common good of the business firm? What kind of community is the political community? 
Well, is it fundamentally intrinsic or is it instrumental? There is in what uh, the late Sir Isaiah Berlin referred to as the central tradition of Western thought about morality, including political morality, a powerful current of thought that the common good of political society is an intrinsic good. This seems pretty clearly to have been the view of Aristotle. And many self-identified Thomists are firmly convinced that it was the view of Aristotle's greatest interpreter and expositor, the medieval philosopher Thomas Aquinas. Finnis, however, argues that the common good of political society, though, to quote Aristotle, great and godlike in its range and importance, is nevertheless fundamentally an instrumental, not an intrinsic good. So Finnis puts it on the side of the business firm, not on the side of the family or um, religious community. And he further argues that the instrumental nature of the common good of political society entails limitations of the legitimate scope of governmental authority, limitations that, though not in every case easily articulable in the language of rights, nevertheless are requirements of justice. Now, although I have a difference at the margins uh, with uh, uh, Professor Finnis uh, on the question of what just the limits, uh, what the uh, just limits are. I agree that the common good of political society is fundamentally an instrumental good, not an intrinsic one, and that this entails moral limits on justified governmental power. The way we've come to think of these limits is in terms of what is usually called the doctrine of subsidiarity. This is, I believe, a sound doctrine, though the label has now been appropriated by some people who, for whatever reason, want to use the word without actually signing on to the doctrine. Now, without implying bad faith on anyone's part, this amounts, I think, to an abuse and destabilizes the word's meaning in a way that may eventually render it useless. That happens to good words all the time. Still, we have no better label or word for it at the moment, so let's just try to be clear in our minds about what the doctrine actually holds. You don't actually hear that much about subsidiarity in American political thought, although we're hearing about it a little more these days than we used to. It's become uh, a staple of European political thought, including European practical uh, uh, politics. Uh, and since we're hearing about it more uh, on this side of the Atlantic or in Anglo-American uh, political philosophy, uh, it's uh, worthwhile to understand just what it's all about. Pope Pius XI, uh, in an encyclical letter in 1931 called Quadragesimo Anno, uh, explained it pretty well. Uh, he said, and I quote, just as it is wrong to withdraw from the individual and commit to a group what private initiative and effort can accomplish, so too it is wrong for a larger and higher association to arrogate to itself functions which can be performed efficiently by smaller and lower associations. This is a fixed, unchanged, and most weighty principle of moral philosophy. Of its very nature, the true aim of all social activity should be to help members of a social body and never to absorb or destroy them." Unquote. So the basic idea of subsidiarity is that if a problem can be solved, by individual initiative, thought, deliberation, action, let it be solved there. If it can't be solved at the individual level, but by group requires group effort, if it can be solved efficiently and well by a small private association, a religious community, a civic association, let it be done there. If it can't be handled properly at that level, if it needs to be handled by government, Let's handle it at the lowest level of government so decisions are made closest to the people who will be affected by the decisions. If it can't be made well, problem can't be handled by local government, perhaps it can be handled by regional government. If so, do it there and only shift it to national or international institutions where it can't be handled closer to the people over whom the power is being exercised and for whose benefit, presumably, uh, the uh, decisions are being made. Now, this principle of justice, subsidiarity, and of the common good reflects a particular understanding of the nature and content of human flourishing, human well-being, what Aristotle referred to as eudaimonia. Flourishing consists, as Aristotle taught, and I think it might be his most important lesson, <laughs> Flourishing consists in 
doing things, in activity, not just in getting things or having desirable or pleasant experiences, which might be the product not as of, of effort and activity, but of Valium, or having things done for you. The good, flourishing, well-being, consists in doing things. The philosopher Patrick Supis, commenting on Aristotle, explained, and I quote, that flourishing or happiness is not a state of feeling, but an activity, unquote. Bingo. Exactly right. Human goods, friendship, knowledge, acquisition and, and exercise of skills, aesthetic appreciation, uh, friendship, uh, the uh, uh, development and exercise of good character, all of these things are realized by acting, by doing things, by participating in these goods, thus enriching one's life and even ennobling oneself as one exercises and fulfills one's natural human capacities for friendship, for example, or for knowledge, or for critical aesthetic appreciation, or for the acquisition and development and exercise of skills, as in ballet or chess or football or what have you. The human good is variegated. There's not some single human good. There are many different irreducible aspects of human well-being and fulfillment that together constitute the integral human good. And so the common good is, as Finnis remarked, best conceived as a set of conditions. But we must ask, conditions for what? Well, let's recall Professor Finnis's definition. Conditions for enabling members of a community to attain for themselves, the stress again on activity, not just passive reception, for themselves reasonable objectives or to reasonably realize for themselves the values for the sake of which they have reason to collaborate with each other in community. The common good is in this sense facilitative. Its elements are what enable, enable people to do things or better enable or empower people to do things individually and in cooperation with others things the doing of which, to a significant degree, constitutes their all-round or integral flourishing, enables them to lead a human life worth leading. That's a human life of actually doing things, and not a human life that you might live uh, lying down in a bed under the influence of a drug or on Robert Nozick's hypothetical experience machine where you have the experience of doing all sorts of wonderful things, writing the great American novel, kicking a 52-yard field goal, studying with Professor McConnell, but you actually haven't done anything. You've been lying in a bed on the drug or on the experience machine. Under favoring conditions, people can more fully and more successfully carry out reasonable projects, pursue reasonable objectives, and thus participate in values, including some values that are inherently social, in that they fulfill persons in respect of capacities for non-instrumental forms of interpersonal communion that are indeed constitutive of their well-being and fulfillment. Properly understood, then, the common good requires, as a matter of justice, limited government, government that respects the needs and rights of people to pursue objectives and realize goods for themselves. The fundamental role of legitimate government and thus the responsibility of legitimate rulers, rulers who serve, is not to be doing things for people that they could do for themselves. It's rather to be helping to establish and maintain conditions that favor people's doing things for themselves and with and for each other, things that are worth doing, things that are ultimately fulfilling of our basic human capacities, human goods. Government should do things for people as opposed to letting people do things for themselves only where individuals and non-governmental institutions of civil society cannot do them or cannot reasonably expected to do them for themselves. Finnish used the word enable, which I put some emphasis on earlier, and it's the right word here. The government's legitimate concern is with the establishment and maintenance of the conditions under which members of the community are enabled to pursue the projects and goals by and through which they participate in the goods constitutive of their flourishing. That's of the essence of what subsidiarity requires. Now, this fundamentally facilitative conception of the common good, 
does not require a doctrinaire libertarianism, either in the domain of political economy or social morality. But it clearly does exclude corporatist or extreme socialist policies that, to recall those words from Pius XI, quote, withdraw from the individual and commit to the group what private initiative and effort can accomplish, unquote, or which remove from the family or the religious or civic association and commit to government what can be accomplished by non-governmental collaborative effort. Surely a conception of the common good that is serious about the principle of subsidiarity will respect private property and take care to maintain a reasonably free system of economic exchange, that is a market economy, social, that is to say, comprehensive or even widespread state ownership of the means of production is plainly incompatible with subsidiarity's concerns and objectives, as is anything that resembles a true command economy, you know, the old Soviet five-year plans. And this would be true even if the record of socialist states like the Soviet Union were benign when it came to respect for civil liberties and political freedom, which on the whole it certainly is not. And it would be true, even if, again, contrary to the historical record, private property in the market economy weren't necessary as checks against the excessive concentration and abuse of power in the hands of public officials. But as I've noted, the historical record demonstrates that private property in the market system, while not sufficient as guarantees against the concentration and abuse of political power, are for all intents and purposes necessary conditions for civil liberty and limited government. And there's a profound lesson in this for those of us who are interested in ensuring that rulers remain servants, ruling in the interests of citizens, and do not reduce citizens to the conditions of dependency or servitude to the status of subjects. For it's central, it's critical to the effective limitation of governmental power that there be substantial non-governmental centers of power in society, and private property in the market economy not only provide the conditions of social mobility, which is important to the common good in any modern or democratic society, but also ensure that there are significant resources and thus opportunities for people and the private associations they form that are not in the control of governmental officials or the apparatus of the state. Now, to say all this, all of which I think is true, is not to say, just as to say what I said before, is not to embrace a doctrinaire libertarianism, is not to say that it is acceptable to have concentrations of power in private hands to the extent that you have a plutocracy. That, too, would be a problem for the same reason that an excessive concentration of power in the hands of public officials would be a bad thing. The good thing is a diffusion of power, where it is a true diffusion and not crony capitalism and plutocracy masquerading as free enterprise and democracy, which crony capitalism and plutocracy are not. Whatever they are, they are not free enterprise and democracy. You want a diffusion of power that benefits society as a whole, including the least well-off, and not only those who immediately benefit economically from the possession of property or the ability to profit in the market. What you really want are conditions of social mobility, conditions from which, as uh, Michael pointed out, uh, I myself massively uh, benefited being the grandson of uh, immigrant coal miners. And I'm not simply here talking about general prosperity, though that is yet another benefit of private property in the market system. I'm talking about the benefit to all in terms of liberty, opportunity, and security of the diffusion of power. And this goes well beyond economics. If we understand the common good, if we grasp, uh, we have a grasp of what constitutes or is conducive to the flourishing of human beings and what is not, we'll recognize that limited government is also important because it permits the functioning and flourishing of non-governmental institutions of civil society. Those Burkean little platoons again, families, churches, civic associations, that perform better than government could ever conceivably do the most basic and essential health, education, and welfare functions, getting the baby diapered, getting the children fed and off to school, uh, uh, handling the problems with uh, the, the kids uh, at Little League and so forth. These institutions are the institutions which play, above all, the primary role in transmitting to each new generation the virtues without which free societies simply cannot survive. And there's no way to replace these institutions with something 
better. Now, what are those virtues that free societies require and that the institutions of civil society have the primary role in transmitting? Well, let me tell you what they are. Basic honesty, integrity, self-restraint, concern for other people and not just for oneself, respect for the dignity and rights of others, civic mindedness, and we could go on. These non-governmental authority structures, families, churches, synagogues, mosques, civic associations, little league, campfire girls, these non-governmental structures represent another crucial way in which power is properly diffused and not concentrated in the hands of the state and its officials. These institutions, these little platoons, can play their role only when government is limited, for unlimited government always usurps their authority and destroys their autonomy, usually recruiting or commandeering them into being state functionary organs. And where they are playing their proper role, they help to create conditions in which the ideal of limited government is much more likely to be realized and preserved and its benefits enjoyed by the people. Because these institutions of civil society are playing their role, they're transmitting these basic virtues needed by every institution of society, but which the civil society institutions alone can really transmit. They're playing their role in forming people who are capable of being good citizens, relying on themselves, carrying their share of the load, are civic-minded, have respect for others, exercise self-restraint, all of which creates the momentum, the social basis, for limited government. Now, I'll return to these institutions of civil society toward the end of my remarks, but now let me shift to the discussion, uh, shift the discussion to the question of constitutional constraints on governmental power. Notice that so far I've said nothing about that. Historically, political theorists have focused on the need for such constraints as the most obvious and important way to ensure that governmental power remains limited and that rulers serve the people and do not become tyrants. And I myself think that constraints of this nature are important, vitally important, in this cause. Though I'm going to eventually get around to saying that they are likely to be effective, these constitutional constraints, only when they are part of a larger picture in which they are supported by and in turn support other features of social life that help to keep the government within its proper bounds for the sake of the common good. So as important as they are, and I spend a lot of my time at Princeton preaching to my students the importance of constitutional constraints on governmental power. So as important as I think they are, still I'd warn against placing too great an emphasis on constitutional constraints. The danger is ignoring other essential features if you put too much of the emphasis just on the constitutional constraints. Now, the Constitution of the United States is famous for its Madisonian system, so-called Madisonian system, of structural constraints on powers of the central government. More than 200 years of experience with the system gives us a pretty good perspective on uh, both its strengths and its limitations. The major constraints are, first, the doctrine of the general government as a government of delegated and enumerated and therefore limited powers. Two, the dual sovereignty of the general government and the states, with the states functioning as governments of general jurisdiction, exercising generalized police powers, a kind of plenary authority, limited under the national constitution only by prohibitions, uh, constitutional prohibitions, or by grants of power to the general government in a federal union. Third, the separation of legislative, executive, and judicial powers within the national government, creating the so-called system of checks and balances that everybody learned about in civics class in high school, that limits the power of any one branch and, it's hoped, improves the quality of government by making the legislative and policy-making process more challenging, slower, and more deliberative. And fourth, the practice, nowhere expressly authorized in the Constitution, but lay that aside for now, or nowhere expressly authorized in the text of the Constitution, the practice of constitutional judicial review by the federal courts, 
Now, sometimes for perfectly good reasons, judicial review is not presented as a structural constraint, but as a potential source of limiting governmental power that may be contrasted with constitutional structural constraints, such as the delegated powers theory of the central government, the separation of powers, and federalism. Now, I often ask my students at the beginning of my undergraduate course on civil liberties how the framers of the Constitution of the United States sought to preserve liberty and prevent tyranny. Now, uh, here's the way the typical answer goes. Well, professor, I can tell you how the framers of the Constitution sought to protect liberty and prevent tyranny. They attached to the Constitution a Bill of Rights. It's there to protect the individual and minorities against the tyranny of the majority. And they vested the power to enforce those rights in the hands of judges who serve for life, are not subject to election or recall, cannot be removed from office except on impeachment for serious misconduct, and are therefore able to protect people's rights without fear of political retaliation. My students are quite confident that they've given me the right answer. Uh, and the answer that they've given is not just one that students give, it's one that lots of other people give. I suppose most editorial boards and even members of Congress would give that answer. But I think it's the wrong answer. The American founders, even among those who favored judicial review and regarded it as implicit in the Constitution, even though not expressly granted, which not all did, believed that uh, no, they did not believe that judicial review was the central constraint on the power of the national government, nor did they believe that the enforcement of the Bill of Rights guarantees by the courts was the fundamental, basic, most important way of protecting liberty. The Federalists, in the original sense of those who supported ratification of the proposed Constitution, the people who wrote the Federalist Papers, for example, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, generally opposed the addition of a Bill of Rights. They opposed it. Yep, that's true. You heard it. You heard me right. These great founders we revere opposed the Bill of Rights. But they opposed it not because they were enemies of freedom or didn't care about freedom, but because they feared that the addition of a Bill of Rights would actually undermine what Hamilton, for example, regard, for, for example regarded as the main structural constraints protecting freedom and preventing tyranny, namely the conception and public understanding of the general government, not as a government of general jurisdiction, but as a government of delegated and enumerated powers, the division of powers, and the division of powers between the national government and the states in a system of dual sovereignty. When political necessity forced the supporters of the Constitution to yield to demands for a Bill of Rights in the form of the first eight amendments to the Constitution, they took care to add two more amendments, the ninth and tenth, designed to, in my view, it's controversial, but in my view, it's clearly true of the tenth, to reinforce the limited government principles that they feared would be obscured or weakened by the inclusion of the Bill of Rights. Now, as for the way judicial review has functioned as a constraint on governmental power in American history, to suffice it to say that the practice has given political philosophers who are critics of judicial review uh, such as uh, Columbia University's uh, Jeremy Waldron, plenty, uh, sorry, NYU's University's Professor Jen Jeremy Waldron, he has moved from Columbia to NYU, plenty of ammunition in making the case to nations that do not have judicial review that adopting it would be an imprudent and even dangerous thing to do. The federal courts and the Supreme Court in particular have had their glory moments to be sure such as in the racial desegregation case of Brown against the Board of Education in the 1950s. But they've also handed down decisions from Dred Scott versus Sanders, Sanders in the 1850s, which facilitated the expansion of slavery, to Lochner against New York in the early 20th century, which struck down state worker protection laws, limiting working hours in a bakery to uh, 60 hours per week. Uh, two, for some Americans, those who are critical of Roe versus Wade and those who are critical of Citizens United, those cases, in which the critics of these cases insist the justices have drawn, uh, the justices have overstepped the bounds of their own authority and unconstitutionally imposed their personal moral opinions and political views on the entire nation. Now, quite apart from whatever one's views happen to be on slavery or worker protection laws or abortion or campaign finance laws, these decisions are regarded by their critics as usurpations of the authority of the democratically constituted people to govern themselves. 
And almost nobody thinks that the record here is not mixed. If you like Roe versus Wade, the odds are pretty good that you don't like Citizens United, even though those cases don't have anything to do with each other. One's about abortion, one's about campaign finance reform. But liberals tend to think that Citizens United is a classic case of the judiciary imposing its political values uh, on the people as a whole with no warrant in the text or logic or structure, original understanding of the Constitution. Conservatives tend to think that Roe versus Wade fits exactly the same description as a case of usurpation. Moreover, since the 1930s, courts have done very little by way of exercising the power of judicial review to support the other constitutional constraints on the exercise of central governmental power. A very small number of isolated decisions have struck down this or that specific piece of federal legislation as exceeding the delegated powers of the national government or trenching upon the reserve powers of the states. But that's really about it. Most recently, the Supreme Court, spectacularly, the Supreme Court found a way by a bare majority to uphold what seemed to many to be rather an obvious case of constitutional overreaching by the national government. The imposition of an individual mandate requiring to, uh, citizens to purchase health insurance coverage as part of President Obama's Signature Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. You all know about this because we've all lived through the controversy. The government defended the mandate as a legitimate exercise of the expressly delegated power of the national government to regulate commerce among the several states. The trouble, of course, is that on its face, the mandate does not appear to regulate commerce at all. It seems to force people into commerce, a particular kind of commerce, on pain of a financial penalty. Now, the court's four liberal justices were willing to stick to what has become a longstanding tradition for those on that side of the court, namely counting virtually anything the national government proposes to do as a legitimate exercise of the power to regulate interstate commerce if that's what the government says it is. The five more conservative justices were willing to say that whatever is going on with the imposition of a mandate to purchase health insurance, it's not regulating interstate commerce. One of the five, however, Chief Justice Roberts, decided to reinterpret the penalty as a tax. He then joined the four justices on the other side to uphold the mandate and the legislation as a whole as constitutionally permissible. Now that's a little odd in view of the fact that the Obama administration and its supporters in Congress had repeatedly and vociferously denied that the penalty was a tax during the debate that led up to the passage of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And there are other constitutional questions that arise and that weren't addressed by the Chief Justice if one regards the tax as a penalty. I'm sorry, the penalty as a tax. Many critics of the decision say that the matter should not have ended up there at all in the courts. Congress itself and the president, they say, should have recognized and honored the fact that the Constitution doesn't empower the national government to impose a mandate on people to purchase products, including health care coverage. Now, whether one agrees with that position or doesn't agree with it, it should remind us that one of the problems with judicial review in general is that its practice tends to encourage the belief among legislators, and worse still among the citizens more broadly, that the constitutionality of proposed legislation is not the concern of the people's representatives. If a proposed piece of legislation is unconstitutional, they say, then it's up to the courts to strike it down. But this is a travesty. For constitutional constraints to accomplish what they're meant to accomplish, for them to constrain the power of the government as they're meant to do, the question of the constitutionality of legislation in light of those constraints is not just the business of courts. In fact, it's everybody's business. Judges, yes, exercising judicial review, but also legislators, executives, and the people themselves. Uh, I don't know if uh, any, of, uh, any of you do what I occasionally uh, do for reasons I've never been able to understand in myself, which is to watch uh, legislative debates on C-SPAN. So you see, you know, it's two senators in an otherwise empty chamber, and they're debating a, a piece of uh, legislation. I don't know why I do that. But um, sometimes you will witness the following. The senator on one side is supporting a piece of legislation. Perhaps he introduced the legislation. The senator says, we need to enact this legislation because the American people deserve, and then he tells you why you need to enact the legislation. The guy in the other party on the other side says, well, this is bad legislation. This advances the interests of the powerful or the wealthy or violates some principle. Uh, and it's on top of all that, it's unconstitutional. 
And the first senator res respond by saying, well, if it's unconstitutional, the courts will let us know. The courts will tell us. But that's, that really just is a travesty. It was never the design of the founders to say that, well, look, we're just going to let legislators do whatever they want. They're just going to try to figure out what would be best, all things considered. Then they'll shift things over. They'll shift, shift the question up to the courts. And ultimately, the Supreme Court will tell us whether what we're doing is constitutional or not. It should be a subject of legislative debate. It should be debated right there. It should, the president, often in connection with the question of whether he should veto a bill, which presidents sometimes do, and I mean not just veto bills, but they should sometimes do it on the right grounds, which is to say I'm vetoing this bill because it's unconstitutional. But us too, as part of the public debate about matters, should make our take our stances, make our decisions, not simply on whether we like or don't like a piece of legislation, but on whether we think, for example, Congress has the delegated authority under the Constitution to enact this, whether we like the legislation in principle or not. And that brings me to the critical yet oddly neglected subject of political culture. Now, I mentioned Professor Waldron earlier, a very distinguished uh, uh, moral and political uh, philosopher and a good friend of mine. Now, a few years ago, he visited his native New Zealand to read, to read his countrymen the Riot Act about what he condemned as the abysmal quality of that nation's parliamentary debate. The bulk of his lecture was devoted to an analysis and critique of a range of factors leading to the impoverishment of legislative deliberation, warranting the stinging title he assigned to his lecture, Parliamentary Recklessness. Its penultimate section, entitled Parliamentary Debate, uh, offered a thoroughly gloomy appraisal of the situation in the New Zealand Parliament. But instead of ending there, offering no grounds for hope, Professor Waldron concluded with a section in which he points to the possibility that the deficiencies of parliamentary debate may be at least partially compensated for by a higher quality of debate among the public, the people who elect the members of, of parliament. And Waldron even hinted that a higher quality of public debate could prompt the reforms necessary to at least begin restoring the integrity of parliamentary debate. But, he warned, that things could also go precisely the opposite way. The corruption of parliamentary debate could, quote, infect the political culture at large, unquote, driving public debate down to the condition of parliamentary debate, condition he chillingly described in the following terms. See if this sounds familiar to you. Quote, Parliament becomes a place where the governing party thinks it has won a great victory when debate is closed down and measures are pushed through under urgency, and the social and political forum generally becomes a place where the greatest victory is drowning out your opponent with the noise that you can bring to bear, and then the premium is on name-calling, on who can bawl the loudest, who can most readily trivialize an opponent's position, who can succeed in embarrassing or shaming or, if needed, blackmailing into silence anyone who holds a different view, unquote. So in a sense, it's up to the people, we Americans would say, we the people, to decide whether we will rise above the corruption that has demeaned parliamentary politics, and not just in New Zealand, or permit it to, quote, infect the political culture at large, unquote. But remember that the people, we the people, are not some undifferentiated mass. They are people, you and me, individuals. Now, of course, considered as isolated actors, there's not a lot that any individual, uh, that individuals can do to affect the political culture. But individuals can cooperate for greater effectiveness in procuring an agenda of conservation or reform. And they can create associations and institutions that are capable of making a difference. Everything from lobbying or pressure groups to think tanks or think and do uh, tanks uh, to academic uh, programs that are meant to uh, elevate uh, public understanding and therefore public debate of uh, crucial issues. A critical element in any discussion of the quality of democratic deliberation and decision making that amounts to anything more than hot air will be, though, the indispensable role of non-governmental institutions of civil society, 
sparks little platoons yet again. The role of those institutions, families, churches, civic associations, private associations of every kind, religious and secular, their role in sustaining a culture in which political institutions do what they are established to do under the Constitution, do it well, subject to human fallibility and frailty, but as well as can be done, and don't do what they are not authorized to do. Stay within the lines, stay within their limits, observe and respect the limits of their own authority, even if they think we can do a lot of good by usurping somebody else's authority or going beyond what we've been constitutionally authorized to do. And so we must be mindful that bad behavior on the part of political institutions, which means, of course, bad behavior on the part of the people who exercise power as holders of public offices, can weaken, enervate, and even corrupt the institutions of civil society, rendering them, for all intents and purposes, impotent to resist the bad behavior and you, of government, the usurpative behavior of government, and therefore useless to the cause of political reform. One of the reasons you need healthy institutions of civil society is that when political reform is needed, those institutions can become the base of reform. Just look at what happened, to a very dramatic case, in Poland with respect to the ultimate collapse of communism. It was institutions of civil society, the Catholic Church in Poland, the Solidarity Labor Union, alternative authority structures that provided the educational inspirational base for, in that case, a very dramatic reform uh, movement. But less dramatically, it happens all the time. Look at the way, and this actually is pretty dramatic in itself, look at the way in which churches, especially historically African-American churches, played the educational and inspirational role, these institutions of civil society, in the civil rights struggle, in the struggle for racial justice? Is it any accident that it was the Reverend Martin Luther King leading the charge, assisted by his chief lieutenant, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, and the Reverend Hosea Williams, and so forth and so on? Now, my point, and this is why I promised to return to it at the end, uh, uh, is that this is true generally and it's certainly true with respect to the bad behavior of public officials who betray their obligation to serve by transgressing the bounds of their constitutional authority and the limits embodied in the doctrine of subsidiarity. Constitutional constraints, including the key structural constraints, are important, very important. As I say, I preach that to my students. But as important as they are, they will be effective only, only where they are effectually supported by the people, that is, by the political culture. Otherwise, you just pay lip service to them. Public officials just pay lip service to them. If there's no public pressure on public officials to stay within the lines, to observe constitutional limits, if the political culture isn't providing that, then it really is just hot air. It's just, it's just uh, of no practical value. The people need to understand the constitutional constraints, especially the structural constraints, and the people need to value them for the role they play in the constitutional system and in maintaining a just social order. They need to value them enough to resist usurpations by their rulers, even when unconstitutional programs offer immediate gratifications or the relief of urgent problems, and that's the hard part. This, in turn, requires certain virtues, civic virtues, habits, traits of character, strengths of character among the people, not just among the politicians, not just among the office holders, among the people. But these virtues don't just fall down from heaven. They have to be transmitted through the generations and nurtured by each generation. If they're not, then Nobody will stand up, uh, no one will resist when public office holders who want more power for themselves, even out of good motives, not because they want to be tyrants, but because they want to do good, but they want more power than they're given under the Constitution, and they offer people relief from a depression, economic security, military security, uh, relieve people's fear, if only you'll give me power, don't worry too much about whether the Constitution authorizes it, give me the power because I'll protect you. 
I'll look after your interest. I'll make things better for you. If you do not have certain virtues, you're going to yield to that. And that's why people need to have those virtues as well as an understanding of the constitutional system. This is why civic education is so important. Madison said only a well-educated people can permanently be a free people. Those virtues need to be there, and they're not going to be there if the institutions of civil society don't nurture and promote them and transmit them from generation to generation. Government can't do that and won't do that. This points to the fact that even the best constitutional structures, and ours are good, I believe ours are very good, even the strongest structural constraints on governmental power aren't worth the paper they're printed on if the people don't understand them, value them, and have the will to resist the blandishments of those offering something tempting in return for giving them up or letting violations of them occur without swift and certain political retaliation. But it's also true that virtue is needed. And that's not merely, in addition to the constitutional constraints, virtue is needed, and that's not merely a matter of improving civics teaching in high schools. The Constitution of the United States was famously defended by Madison in Federalist Paper Number 51 as, quote, supplying by opposite and rival interests the defect of better motives, unquote. He made this point immediately after observing that the first task of government is to control the governed, and the second is to control itself. He allowed that, quote, a dependence on the people, listen to this, a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government, but experience has taught mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions, unquote. Hence the constitutional const uh, structural constraints, the auxiliary precautions. But even in this formulation, which is highlighting the need for the auxiliary precautions, even in this formulation, those Constitutional constraints do not stand alone. Indeed, they are presented quite explicitly as secondary. Secondary. What does he say the primary constraint is? The primary control is the people themselves, a dependence on the people. What's also necessary is a dependence on the people, hence a healthy and vibrant political culture to keep the rulers in line. But that brings us back to the role and importance of virtue. John Adams understood this as well as anybody. Uh, he understood the general theory of the Constitution as well as anybody. He was the ablest scholar. People sometimes think Jefferson was. He wasn't. He was fine, but Adams was the ablest and best political theorist of the founding generation. He certainly got the point about supplying the defect of better motives, yet he also understood that the health of political culture was an indispensable element of the success of the constitutional enterprise an enterprise of ensuring that the rulers stay within the bounds of their legitimate authority and indeed be servants of the common good, servants of the people they rule. He famously remarked that our Constitution is for a moral and religious people and is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. He was pointing there to the importance of political culture, to virtue in the people, to make the constitutional system work. A people lacking in virtue, he believed, could be counted on. Could be counted on. If you didn't have virtue, this is going to happen. People will trade their liberty for protection, for financial or personal security, for comfort, for being looked after, for being taken care of, for having their problems solved by government quickly. And there will always be people occupying or standing for public office who will be happy to offer the deal, an expansion of their power in return for what they're offering in return for that expansion. So the question then is, how to form people. It's about formation of people. How to form people, fit it out with the virtues, making them worthy of freedom and capable of preserving constitutional principles, even in the face of strong temptations which inevitably come to compromise those principles away. And here we see the central political role and significance of the most basic institutions of civil society, the family, the religious communities, the private associations and organizations of every type that are devoted to the inculcation of knowledge and virtue, private educational institutions as well as public ones, all the institutions that are in the business of transmitting essential virtues. These are indeed, as is often said, mediating institutions, mediating, that provide a buffer that mediate between the individual and the power of the central state, a point that's been developed quite brilliantly by the Harvard law professor, Mary Ann Glendon. 
It's ultimately the autonomy, integrity, and general flourishing of these institutions of civil society that will determine the fate of limited constitutional government. And this is not only because of their primary and indispensable role in transmitting virtues, it's also because of their performance of basic health education and welfare functions as the only alternative to the removal of these functions to larger and higher associations, that is to say, to government at higher and higher levels. When the government expands to play the primary role, when it displaces the institutions of civil society, when it expands to play the primary role in performing these functions, the ideal of limited government is soon lost, no matter the formal structural constitutional constraints of the Constitution. Uh, I think it was Justice Scalia who often, one of the justices often uh, uh, pointed out uh, that uh, if all you're interested in is whether the Constitution's principles are great, Go have a look at the Constitution of the Soviet Union. Fantastic. All your liberties are protected, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But of course, it was all a sham. It was all a fraud. What matters is not the words on the page. It's the actual practice. And if the principles are to actually be observed by the government, the people need certain virtues that will enable them to understand the need for those principles, the point of those principles, and their obligation to defend them. And the corresponding weakening of the status and authority of the institutions of civil society damages their ability to perform all of their functions, including their moral and pedagogical ones. With that, when they've lost that, they surely also lose their capacity to influence for good the political culture, the political culture, which at the end of the day is the whole shooting match when it comes to whether rulers can truly be servants. Thank you. 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 Thank